which way to go. There's a fork in the road. There's a, a, you got options. And the Apostle Paul had options. He could either go back to the Pharisee organization or he could go with the church of Jesus Christ. But remember, he had been dragging Christians that was in the way. It wasn't called Christians at the time. It was called the way. People that were in the way, he was getting them and he had all of the authorization from the Sanhedrin to do that. It says in uh, Acts 9, verse, verse number 1, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that he find any of this way. Acts 9, verse 2. Whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. So this is our setting. The setting is he had been given the authorization to arrest anybody that was calling themselves a Christian. Arrest them and bound them and take them back to Jerusalem to be tried. Now, while he was on his way here, all of a sudden, he's got an experience. And this is what I was talking about Sunday, about a conversion. I feel the Lord leading us to deal with the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. Drop down to verse number 17. It says in, of Paul, he, the last part of that says that he would receive his sight and he might be filled with the Holy Ghost. And I feel like we need to work on that. We need to work on being filled with the Holy Ghost. Um, and one of the main reasons why I feel led to do that is because of the new people that are in the church. We have five visitors Sunday. And um, it's just, we're getting a continual uh, people coming by. Some stay, five come. Well, if you count uh, Sister Megan, it would be six because it was her second time. So you got six people here. Six come, one may stay. Two, three, four, however many. So we, well, I said that because I want to be able to sow as many seeds as we can in the life of that seeker on their way, on their journey. And they would notice the term seeker. Some people are looking for where to land, where to settle. And so we want to sow seeds. We don't, it's not like we're trying to membership them, marry them, make them a part. But if God's calling them to do that, then we want to do that. So some may come by, get saved when we make an altar call. Some may get water baptized and then go on. Some will get the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's very essential that every believer has that experience to be filled with the Holy Ghost. And so Paul was in the gap. So write down G-A-P. When you're in the gap, what are you doing? I got this, grasping after purpose. Grasping after purpose. That's the gap. The G is for grasping, A for after, P for purpose. Everybody wants to know their purpose. Everybody wants to know what are they called to do. What does God want me to do? Who does God want me to marry? Where does God want me to live? Where does God want me to go to school? Where does God want me to work? What is my future? You know, you got, court, you got life phases. Paul had a life phase. Most historians say he was probably around 30 years old at this time. To me, that's the quarter life. 25 years old from 25 younger is the first quarter of your life. That's a quarter life. I think you can have a quarter life dramatic experience of trying to realize who you are. The world will call it a uh, crisis. Then you got a midlife, around 50 years old. Midlife, they call that a crisis. Well, I just think it's a time when you're reassessing your bearings of who you are. And then you got a three-quarter life when you get 75, 80 years old. 
And so there's something about the human brain, anatomy, that goes through these transitions on these, at these quarters. God is all about numbers. He wrote a whole book about it. So Paul is in his quarter life time period, and he's making a decision on what he's going to do and the lifestyle that he's going to live. And God calls him, and verse number seven says, when he was journeying, he stood speechless hearing a voice, but seeing no man. He arose from the earth and he went, when he, we arose from the earth and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. And they led him by hand and brought him into Damascus. Damascus. Notice the people that Paul led is now leading him because he can't see. In verse number nine, it says, and when he was three days without sight, nor did he eat or drink, he did not, he fasted. Remember, Paul knew the law. Let's find that scripture. Hold your finger in Acts 9. It said in Philippians 2, no, Philippians 3, and verse number 5, 3 and 5 of Philippians. It says, um, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. And then look at this, touching the law, a Pharisee. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is of the law. Look at verse 6, Paul said he was blameless. He understood the law. He, he, he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He wasn't just an average Pharisee. He had rank. So go back to Acts. So here Paul is going to fast in verse 9. And then here we, I want to work on Ananias. We mentioned him a little bit Sunday. There wasn't a whole lot about him, but he too was in the gap, grasping after purpose. It says right here of Ananias in verse number 10, there was a certain di disciple at Damascus named Ananias. Now, notice he's a disciple. And back in verse 2, Paul was sent to get all of the disciples, anybody that was in the way. And to him he said, Lord, in a vision. Ananias, and he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise, go into the street, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas, the one called Saul of Tarsus. And behold, he prayeth, and he hath seen a vision. Hold on right there. How did he see a vision? Underline that. Most historians say that Ananias was 87 years old. So Ananias is in, he's looking, he's grasping after purpose too. He's in his three-quarter life span. 87 years old, old prophet here. And it says in verse 12, and Paul seen a vision. In the vision, he seen Ananias. How did Paul see a vision and he was blind? Anybody? How did Paul see when he was blind? That's right. He had insight without having eyesight. That's something good to write down. He had insight without having eyesight. God can give you insight without you seeing naturally. That's what faith is. I had a doctor today ask me, he was, he's been trying to help a young man that's an atheist, and he said, the guy just can't get his hands around faith. And he said, uh, Dr. Paul, will you help me to understand that? Help me to be able to explain that. And I'm standing there praying, saying, Lord, give me the right words. And it dropped in my heart the scripture, Hebrews 11, 1, and the hope. I said, before you can give somebody faith and they can understand faith, you got to give them hope. They got to understand hope. Hope is not spiritual. You, faith is spiritual. Hope is not. Then the scripture says, now faith is the substance of things what? Hope for. You got to have hope before you have faith. A lot of people will be critical about somebody that's hoping, but 
hope is a level of faith. It's actually the elementary level. It's, your, it's where you try your faith is with hope. But when you mature past hope, then you can exercise faith. So here is Ananias, and he says that Paul got, got or Jesus tells Ananias that Paul had a vision. Ananias looks back at him in verse 13, said, I heard many of this man, and I didn't, what I've heard about him ain't good. How much evil he have done to the saints at Jerusalem. And I hear, I hear that he has authority from the chief priests to bind all that call upon thy name. It's, it's ironic that when God calls you and people know, find out that you're called, they always bring up your past. It says here in verse 15, but the Lord said, <laughs> to me this is a rebuke, but the Lord said, go thy way for he has chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and children of Israel. Look at Paul's Resume. When did Paul do this? Paul, I believe, should have been the 12th disciple to replace Judas instead of Matthias. One of the criteria, hold your finger in Acts 9, go to Acts chapter number 2. One of the requirements to be an apostle was you had to have seen the Lord. Acts 2 and verse number 1. No, verse, go, I'm sorry, Acts 1 and verse number 21. Wherefore these men have compassion or have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us beginning from the baptism of John until the same day that he was taken up from us, must be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. So they're saying in order to be a disciple, an apostle, not just a disciple, you had to have been with the Lord, had an encounter with the Lord, and not only before, but after the resurrection. So what did Jesus do for Paul? He personally appeared to Paul on the Damascus road in verse number four of Acts nine, and says, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he identified himself. In verse five, Paul said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus. So Paul had a personal encounter with Jesus. If you come across anybody that declares that they, that they are an apostle, ask them about their encounter with Jesus. That's the criteria of apostleship. All right, so we go on to find here that um, it says in verse number 15, it gives Paul's resume. And we know that Paul ended up being among the Gentiles because he went, God sent him to the Gentiles and the letters that we have are all Gentile churches, Thessalonica, Laodicea, Colossae, Greek churches. Paul went there. He told Ananias this. He went to Rome and to the children of Israel. The book of Romans, he says, shall the Jew be saved? He says, yes, because that's my brother's. He said, well, I will show you great things he must suffer for my name's sake, in verse 16. And Ananias, verse 17, went his way, entered into the house, putting his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, hath appeared unto thee in the way thou camest, hath sent me to thee, that thou mightest receive thy sight. Okay, hold right there. So Ananias, the one that God told to go pray for Saul, before this, Saul had been told, I'm going to lay hands on Ananias. But the roles are reversed right here. Paul's not arresting Ananias, but Ananias is arresting Paul. He's going to lay hands on him. 
Can you lay hands on who was going to lay hands on you? Here, he says, for I will show you these great things. And then the last part of verse 17, it says, and be filled with the Holy Ghost. So we're going to finish tonight dealing with that. I gave anybody remember my four M's from Sunday? That's right. Yeah. Mm hmm. Good, good. The Apostle Paul was all of those. He had a moment. He, had a, he was a misfit. He was a messenger and he had a message. And I believe the Lord has called us to misfits. Y'all here tonight, we all misfit in some area. And I want you to know that you're, you're at a table where the misfits are being fed. God's feeding us here as misfits. So grasping after purpose. Paul could not go back to the Pharisee organization. They was done with him. And then the Christians, the Jews, they didn't want to have anything to do with him. Look at verse 26. Well, before we go there, immediately after Paul was saved and baptized, verse 18, immediately there fell upon his eyes the scales fell from his eyes. He received sight. He arose and was baptized. And when he had received meat, so he broke his fast, he was strengthened. Then Saul, certain days with the disciples, were at Damascus for certain days. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. But everybody that heard him was amazed and said, is not this the one that destroyed them? That now he's calling on the name in Jerusalem. Came hither with that intent that he might bring them bound unto the chief priests. They said, well, this man can't change. This one day he's binding people up, then tomorrow he's preaching about it. But Saul increased the more in strength, verse 22, confounded the Jews that dealt at Damascus, proving that this is the very Christ. After many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. Remember, Ananias said, God told Ananias, I'm going to call him, but he's going to suffer. Here they're trying to kill him right out of the bat. He hadn't been saved long, just a few days. But their laying awake was known of Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. So look what the disciples did. They took him by night, led him down in the basket. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join to himself to the disciples. All right, so good. So Paul can't go to the Pharisees. He's in the gap. He's grasping after purpose. So he says, you know what? I'm going to go with these people that want me. Read the rest of this. Verse number, what verse we are, 26. Paul says, verse 26, I'm going to Jerusalem. Yay. He goes to join himself to the disciples, but semicolon. But they were all afraid of him. That's sad, ain't it? Here he is in the gap trying to find who do I join? Who do I work with? They was afraid of him. Not only were they afraid, but read the last part. And they believed not that he was a disciple. <laughs> it, if somebody come among us and want to be a part of us, do we believe they are? Or do we got to put them on trial? Trial. trial. No, that ain't right. That's what the disciples did right here. You don't put them on trial. You didn't call them. I didn't call them. It's the Lord that called them. The Bible says in the Lord, give me your scripture. I'm going to give you scripture. You give me yours. All right. While you searching for a scripture. The Lord add to the church. Sometimes you say the wheat and tares can grow together. Yes, sir. It's not about trying someone about them being a part, but you have to try their spirit. 
Absolutely. Try the John 4, 1 John 4. That's what you're looking for. Try the spirits and see if they were a God or not. I'm saying, is he a disciple? I'm not saying you give him a position or do anything like that, but is he called? Is he a believer? Is he saved? The man got the he was water baptized. He got the baptism of the Holy Ghost. He'd been preaching. And now the disciples are afraid of him because of his background. The purpose of this is you got, you, as I said earlier, Ananias judged him based on his background. I know we went through a whole lesson about track record and all that, but this is about salvation. This ain't about position. This isn't about honor or giving them any type of authority, just if they're saved or not. Yes, sir, I got a hand back here. No, but I can't, I won't say opposite. I won't say that they're not. Because the scripture says, I can only go by the scriptures. No, I'm going to lead to the scripture. The Bible says if a man, let's find the scripture in Corinthians, said no man can call on Jesus except by the Holy Ghost. I, we, we cannot... Um, we just have to, if we got to go off their word. Because the scripture says in Romans 10, if any man confess the Lord Jesus, he shall be saved. I'm looking for the scripture. No man can call upon me except by the spirit. It might be second Corinthians. No man can say Jesus is Lord. That's what I'm quoting it. No man can say Jesus is Lord, but by the Holy Spirit. First Corinthians, Corinthians what? First Corinthians 12 and three. Wherefore, I give you to understand that no man speaking by the spirit of God call of Jesus a curse. And that no man can say that Jesus is Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. It, so we can only go by their word if somebody says, I'm saved. So the Apostle Paul was saved. Now, let's just, well, let's just continue on with it. You got a question. Let's continue on with this. Go back to Acts chapter 9. And this is, you, you'll like this part. After they said no, Barnabas took him, verse 27, Acts 9, 27. The disciples, now remember these disciples had been with Jesus. These are apostles. They said no to Paul. Nah. Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way. So now he went to them, to the church. They didn't accept him. So Barnabas, who has accepted him, now takes him before the apostles. And he said he saw the Lord in the way, spoke to him, and he's been preaching. And when he was coming to them and going in and out of Jerusalem, he spake boldly in the name of the Lord. So he's doing a good job disputing against the Grecians. Which when the brethren knew, they brought him down to Caesarea. So he comes among the apostles in verse 30. And then look what they did. They sent him to Tarsus. It's like, okay, you good, but you ain't good here. He was in the gap. He's grasping after purpose. You can't let people determine your purpose. You got to be called for who you are because you might be accepted in some circles and you might not. So you never let people define who you are. We can't define people, but we might, people might come in here and we define them. They may leave, they may stay, whatever. We, we may treat them good, we may not treat them right. Whatever, our, we, whatever method we use, my, per, my message is 
don't receive from the people that it, for your acceptance. Misfit. Paul was a misfit. People that will come here will be misfit. They won't fit in with what we've been doing. But they can't, don't, they should not allow their misfitting to determine their purpose. So the apostle Paul did not let the disciples or the apostles determine who he was. He couldn't stay there though, he had to leave. He leaves in verse number 30, he goes down to Tarsus. Now, if you hold your finger here and go to Galatians chapter number two, it's been a long time since I walked this. Galatians two and verse one. We're using the name Barnabas. Galatians 2, 1. Then 14 years after, everybody say after. after. I went up, what's the next word? Again. <laughs> to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me. So if you go back to Acts chapter 9, verse 30. Paul goes to, Ces goes to Caesarea. They don't accept him. They send him to Tarsus. He stays away from the disciples, the apostles, for 14 years. They sent him away for 14 years. My pastor used to say they sent him away to cool his heels. Paul was a bad man. It was hard for them to accept him. It was hard for them to let him be who he was going to be. But Paul, knowing his purpose, didn't let the apostles define him. And I believe there will be many folks that may come here grasping after purpose and they may move on as a seeker trying to find where God wants them. My prayer is that they know the calling that's on their life and not be defined by our judgment of them. Because the disciples who had been with Jesus, seen him baptized, the dove come down, John beheaded, seen him resurrected, they still had a problem in accepting a misfit. The scriptures were written so we could learn from them. So between verse 30 and verse 31 is 14 years. Look at 31. Then had the churches rest throughout Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost and they grew, they were multiplied. It took getting Paul, Saul, out of the church so that the church could have rest. Paul. He was such a powerful man that they couldn't handle it. There's groups out here, define them however you want to. I'll, I'll work on the body tonight. If, the, if, a, if an apostle, modern day apostle, came among the body of Christ today, would they accept him? Where, where, would he get a seat? be powerful. Stand up, start preaching, and they sit on him. And if congregation sits on him because they're looking at the ministers and the minister not responding, they don't respond. Man could be anointed from heaven, but he may not look like them, he may not dress like them, may not sound, may not know anything about the Ohio River. May, may not be able to call the names of former leaders, cities, towns where we've had big footprints. May not be able to do all of that. 
See, I believe before the church can be back in full restoration order, we going because the early church had problems and we got problems. And before we can get back in and have Christ down among us, we've got to let all of the ministry operate in full authority. And if a misfit comes among us, are we going to send them away for 14 years? Or are we going to welcome them and say, go ahead, brother, take us on into glory? So Paul goes, starts working, builds this tremendous work all over the world. Then they have him back. Peter still had problems with Paul. Y'all see this, this y'all think this book ain't about real people. Go to go to First Peter. It said uh first second Peter chapter fifteen. And then while we're getting that one, somebody find a scripture for me where it's where uh Paul said he withstood Peter. To the face. Just, put, just search for withstood Peter face and get that scripture for me while I'm here in 2 Peter. 2 Peter 3 and verse number 15. It says, And remember here an account of the long suffering of the Lord is salvation. Even as our beloved brother Paul. Also, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. So Peter's saying, I'm writing this letter to you, but I know Paul has already been writing to you. I'm in 2 Peter 3, verse number 15, going into 16. He said, as also in all his epistles, talking about his scriptures, his letters, verse 16, speaking in them things in which some are some things are hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable wrestle with, as they do also other scriptures unto their own destruction. So Peter's saying, Paul's been writing some stuff to y'all. Now I'm trying to write some stuff to y'all, and y'all, y'all here in the gap, y'all grasping after purpose, trying to say, Am I gonna follow Peter? Or am I gonna follow Paul? One scripture. Is it in uh, Colossians? Y'all get that other scripture for me? Uh, Galatians 2.11. 2 While we go into Galatians 2.11, let's stop by uh, Colossians and see what Paul said one time about um, Peter. He says, some said, some said, I'm a Paul. And some said, I'm of Cephas. Cephas is Peter. Wasn't that Colossians? Corinthians? All right. What chapter? Some said I'm of Paul. Some says I'm of Cephas. This is chapter 9. No. That is, he's got Cephas in there. It's chapter 1. In verse 12, now this I say, every one of you saith, I am of Paul. 1 Corinthians 1, 12. Some say I'm of Apollos. Some say I'm of Cephas. Some say I'm of Christ. Verse 13, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? He said, I want to tell you, I thank God I, I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius because you're going to you're going to lift me up so that so in the Corinthian church. 
There, you can write this down. It was four divisions. Go back to verse number 12. It was four divisions in, in the Corinthian church. Some was for Paul, some was Apollos, some was for Cephas, and some was for Jesus. Four divisions. Now, give me that other scripture in Galatians, and we're going to close with that. Galatians, when Paul said, I had to withstood Peter, it's chapter 2, verse 11. Right? Verse 9. No. Yes, verse 11. But when Peter was come to Antioch, <laughs> I withstood him. Get this in the living, Sister Jenny. He said, I withstood him to the face because he was so blamed. The Living Bible says that when Peter came to Antioch, I had to oppose him to his face for what he done or what he, for what he did was very wrong. Human beings. No, it wasn't before he got, it was what he, he would go down to Jerusalem and when he was with, when Peter was with the Gentiles, he would eat whatever. When he was with the Jews, he would eat with the Jews. And then if somebody walked in and saw him eating something weird, he, he's like, ah, oh, no, nah, I, ain't, I ain't eating that. I'm good. <laughs> and Paul said, nah, you, uh-uh. Don't do that. You separating the church. You keeping us divided. We need, we trying to build something here. See, you, we got human nature we dealing with. The apostles had it. None, there was nobody divine except for Jesus. I'm of Apollos. I'm of, I'm of Paul. I'm of Peter. That's the, the body can get that spirit. I'm of this man from this city. I'm from this man from this part of the country. I'm from the campground. I'm from Shepherdsville. I'm from Des Moines. I'm from Louisville. I'm from Houston. No. Nah. You better be from Jesus. Jesus, this, is, this body is Jesus' body. He's the head of the body. Not no, no man, not anything but Jesus. And that's why you need the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Because Paul was a misfit, he was also anointed. And that's what I want to get across in the next few weeks. That you got to, you, you might not fit in, people may not accept you, but you get your anointing first. And don't lose your anointing. And your anointing comes by being filled with the Holy Ghost. Holy Spirit baptism is so essential. It's your identity. It gives you purpose. You don't have to be with the disciples. You don't have to be with the Pharisees. You be in Christ. Paul said, if I be in Christ, I'm a new creature. Old things are passed away. All things become new. My identity is in Christ. I can't lose that. Don't lose your identity in Christ. Rely on the Holy Spirit. Grasping after purpose. All through life, quarter life, mid-life, three-quarter life. All three of those different levels or phases of life, you're always trying to find your purpose for that day and time. But you've got to always be rooted in Christ. It's one reason the apostles and Individuals didn't live long. They trying to find that calling. When, a, when an individual is called, you lose, you lose your, your will to live naturally because you know your purpose and calling is beyond this earth. And so when you get, you get Paul said, I'm, be, I'm betwixt between the two. I, I want to stay here for you, but I want to get out of here because of the calling that's on my life. So it's just, I got this wrestling that's always going on. Then I got a battle with my carnal mind. I know I got this spirit man living in me. I'm trying to make him strong, but I'm always battling with this carnal mind. He said, I want to do right and evil is presence. He said, there's a war going on in my members, the book of Romans. And so the calling, when the calling is on your life, you have a tough time being any earthly good. You try to do the best you can, impact those you can, but you have a higher calling, a greater purpose than this earth. 
And so you always got to keep your eyes on that. Don't lose that. Don't lose that you're in this way to get to a destination. The way is Christ. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth and life. We're in this way, but as we're going along the way, everything we deal with on the way, trying to grasp after purpose, can distract you from the way. And the scripture says, this way is straight. It said it's narrow. There's a broad way out there. Many find that, as if few find the straight in the narrow. Everybody jumps on the broad way. And so, gas, grasping after purpose. All right, before we go, any questions tonight? We're going to have spend some time in prayer. Any questions about Paul? Because you know Paul was a real man with real issues. He said, I, ain't even, I don't have a wife. He said, I can't be like Peter. Peter's got a wife. He's, Paul, was, Paul basically was saying, who, who can marry me? I've been let down in a basket this day. I've been stoned this day. I'm shipwrecked the next day. It's like Jesus. Who could marry Jesus? Who could marry Paul? He said, I ain't as fortunate as Peter to lead around a wife. So the apostles had wives. The Catholic Church don't believe that a preacher can have a wife. And their first apostle is Peter, and he had one. They got the doctrine all messed up. And got them in a lot of trouble over it. Any questions tonight? We're gearing it down. The Lord's helping us. The Spirit of the Lord's helping us. We want to treat people right. You never know who comes in among us. We got to treat them like the Lord would treat them. Jesus knew that Jesus was a devil. None of the disciples knew it. That's a good question somebody should have asked tonight. Judas was a devil from the beginning. Jesus picked him. But yet, he gave him the treasure. He treated him right. It was so, so, so right in disguise that when they said, who's going to betray you? He said, he's dipping into the sop with me. And nah, not Judas. No, he got the money. He's the treasure. Anytime we, had a, we needed a bill or something, Judas was right there. Now, he, Judas was tight, too. When, they, when the woman that had the, the, uh, the alabaster box, she came in and she broke it and, and praying. Over, what did Judas say? <laughs> He's like, oh, we could use this for something. We, got, it's, it's, we could buy groceries. We could have the food ministry. We can uh, have a food bank with all this money. So he was a good treasurer. But the devil entered him, but Jesus treated him right. Even at the arrest of Jesus, Judas, come, well, before that, Jesus said to Judas, whatever you find in your heart to do, he said, go do it, go ahead, go ahead, get on out of here and do it. Do it quickly. He came into the garden, Jesus been praying, the disciples, Peter, James, and John, trying to keep him awake. Judas walks up and he kissed Jesus. Je Jesus, he knew what was going to happen. It was going to go down. Yes, sir. Um, I was, I was going to say, I, I think was earlier we were talking about this that we had come by. One thing, again, through your example of just with Judas, and we have seen different examples in the Bible where God ordained someone to fulfill his glory. Mm -hmm. It wasn't always, quote, unquote, in his name. Mm -hmm. it, it was done in a malicious or even a way for the steal from of the glory of God. Right.
Right. Mm -hmm. But you need to be aware. Absolutely. A hundred percent. I agree with that. Even you know, a Pharaoh was a battle axe for God. He, God used him. And sometimes God might bring a Judas or a bad seed among us to check our spirits to see how we're going to deal with it or to work something out of us. But as you said, always be cautious. I'll give a, a perfect example. If a pedophile if a pedophile came in among us, we need to know that. We need to know a pedophile, a child abuser, somebody like that. We don't just give them free reign. I don't care what their testimony is. You, okay, bless you. But you're gonna have to go somewhere. Yes, ma'am. Even something as, even on the small side. Yeah. Yeah, but they and that's true. But when when do we get, when do we do we if they're teachable, could we be the vessel to teach them? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, I think you I think you should never close off yourself to show the Jesus. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Who had Sister Maxine? Well, I'm saying is that not where it comes in with the child of sin, child of sin? Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you, if you're a man of God, a person of God, you can feel weak. Can you not? Is that what that Sometimes. Is? So, yeah. So, you want to try the spirits, but you can also be deceived. Yeah. That's what that's what we want to be balanced yeah. in that. Yeah. We don't be. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Don't judge them. You know, mm -hmm. Yeah. We just want to be prayerful. More prayerful, more careful. I just feel like the Lord's leading us to be more, to be, we worked on for two years being spirit led. Now, we want to see other people get the spirit. Because some people, uh, who was it? Yeah, I was having breakfast with a pastor the other day, and his wife said to him about an issue in their church, his wife said to him, I don't even think that person is saved. And he, he said, what do you mean? They got the Holy Ghost. And she said, I, I don't know what they got, but I know that I don't think they saved. And so some people, if you don't have any type of conviction, if you don't have conviction, it makes me wonder if you saved. Because if you can just do anything without being checked, you got to be careful. And there's a lot of people out here that have more confidence in the church than they do Jesus. You can have a relationship with this assembly and never meet Jesus. You can have a relationship with the body and not meet Jesus. You can have a relationship with this and not, you can have a head knock, just like you can go to school. And when I was in seminary or cemetery, whatever you want to call it, when I was in there, there was people in cemetery that, that was learning this just like somebody learning a, to be a doctor or a lawyer. And then they, they leave the cemetery and go out and get a church and next thing you know, they're preaching and wasn't even saved. You can have a head knowledge of this. You can have a, you can like the camaraderie of fellowship meetings. I know we're streaming too. You can have camaraderie, you could just like meeting, meetings, conventions. Church. What? Yeah. 
Yeah, gatherings. And, and fit in perfect and never be saved. Because you make all the meetings and Right. Forward. Yeah. It has to progress. If we stay in the same things that our great grandparents did, or mm -hmm. our grandparents, or even our own parents, like we're not going to reach a few people that we know. Right. And I believe that even people we fellowship with are in the gap, and they're stuck, and they're trying to find a purpose. But sometimes tradition will keep you stuck and you won't be willing to move on, as you're saying. And anything that's stagnated will spoil. And you, you can go from being, this is something good to tweet right here, you can go from being a movement to a monument. A movement is something that's alive, doing it, changing the world, then you turn into a monument. And that's what denomination did. All of these denominational forerunners came out, blazing out of the Catholic Church, doing a revival, doing reformation, but now they're just monuments. You go by, they're not, not doing anything. I, my pastor I was talking to in the inner banks, he told me, he said, um, we just dying. We don't have nobody coming in, nothing's happening. And every time I do a funeral, one less member, before you know it, we won't have nothing but a building. Because we have, we, have we have turned into just a caretaking of old folks. We gotta be careful. So when you're in the gap and you're graphing after purpose, you can't get stuck. You gotta find your purpose and your identity must always be in Christ, amen? Anybody have any prayer requests tonight? Sister Clay needs our prayers. Okay. Anybody else? Memory. All right. Let's all stand right here and go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for another Wednesday night. We appreciate your spirit helping us. We appreciate the Apostle Paul and Peter and their lives that they lived. Lord, we want to make sure our identity is in you. We don't call on Paul. We don't call on Peter. We don't call on any apostles. We don't even call on your mama, Mary. We call on you, Lord. And we ask you to give us purpose, identity. Let us know our roles in this earth. Don't want to be in a position that we're stuck. We want to have an open mind to receive what you're saying to the church. He that hath an ear. Let him hear what the Spirit is saying. Lord, touch our ears tonight that we can hear what you're saying. It's not our tradition, it's not our background, not even our own temperament or even our ideology of how we think it should work. But Lord, let us hear what the Spirit is saying. Thank you for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for giving us the Spirit of God. And Lord, we pray that if there's anybody in this assembly that doesn't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we pray tonight that you fill them, Lord. Fill them with your spirit. Let them have that unction of your spirit that they can tap on in the time of grasping, in the time of stuck, in the time of in-between battles. Let them have that spirit to raise up in them to give them light and guidance on the way they should go. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Remember, you don't have any problems. Jesus hasn't changed. He's the same yesterday, today, and God bless you. Pray for us. We're, we're leaving out to the mountains tonight. I know they're calling for some bad storms up there. Um, so pray for us. We'll be ministering up there this weekend.